Last time on The Ables, we watched the kids go trick-or-treating for a very long time. But after that, they reunited with Cleveland Man, a.k.a. Finch, who brought them to a cornfield where he transformed into a giant fire Godzilla. When the kids called for help from our main character's mom, she teleported into the field only to get zapped into a coma by Cleveland Man. And to everyone's surprise, Chad the Bully has mysteriously returned. Will he turn out to be a supervillain? Will Mom ever get out of the coma? Will we ever follow a plot that's actually interesting? Find out this week. Hi, hello, welcome to darkness. This time it's dark because it's nighttime, so. Avi says hello. She was mad that I was talking to someone. It wasn't her, weren't you? She was like, Mommy, who are you talking to? Huh? Who are you talking to, Mother? Who is it? It's two people on the internet, Avi. They want to hear about a bad book. Ooh, that sounds like a terrible idea. It is a terrible idea, Avi. Why do you want to hear about a bad book? I don't know, Avi, I don't know. Could you look more disinterested? Is it possible? <laughs> She's just like, Mother, please. Just gonna stand on the floor and look at me now, Avi, judging me for my choices. Wow, this is a compelling first two lines. I was listening to the television. The news was on. Brilliant, evocative, powerful. I felt it in my soul. I forgot. He says the incident in Central Park had been caught on film, and I forgot what the incident even was, but it was back many chapters ago when that superhero revealed himself, right? Is that what happened? And apparently I thought that they would just find a way to erase everybody's memory, but apparently not. Apparently the public still knows that there might be superheroes and we just haven't talked about it again until now. Here's a fine example of filtering, in case you want to know what that sounds like. I heard the phone ring. You don't need to say he heard it. Obviously he heard it. Just say the phone rang. Bentley is calling. He wants to go back to the library. Why they didn't go before this? Completely unclear. I don't know why they assume that Finch didn't find what he was looking for in the library. Because he's like, we have to find out what he was looking for. Because the last time you saw him, he was in a cornfield doing something completely different. So he probably got what he wanted at the library. I mean, probably not, because they're going to find it, but... Well, at least the kids remember that they had fucking superpowers, because he waits till his dad goes to bed, and he's like, oh, how are my friends going to contact me when they're ready for our top-secret nighttime mission? And then they just teleport into his room because they have a teleporter. So for once, they remembered, well, the main character didn't, but his friends remembered that they have superpowers. Freddy is once again not with them because Freddy is a character who doesn't matter. He's probably gonna be a deus ex machina later and that's the only reason he's around. The main character will not shut up about how genius Bentley is. Every time Bentley says anything, the main character's like, oh my gosh, he's so smart. He's so fucking smart. Did I mention how smart he is? He's smarter than the smartest smarty smart pants. And it's just like, stop it. I, you know it's the author trying to convince us that this character is intelligent, and we're just like, you have to prove it. You can't just say that he is. And so far, he hasn't said anything that a 12-year-old with a computer and Google couldn't say. Now I have a very important question. They're sure that this null power zone, NPZ, underneath the floor is a room in which there is a superpowered person who is able to use this ability, which makes sense. It's, it's a reasonable supposition. So they're going to teleport a robot in to investigate. Not, at least they're not going to teleport themselves in right away. But that begs the question, can you teleport into a null power zone? Does that work? And if so, can you teleport out again? Like, you have no guarantee that when you go in there, whoever's in there will ever let you out. Oh, I guess they changed their plan, so maybe you can't teleport into an NPZ. Um, they're like, no, we're taking, we're going in through the ducts. We're sending the robot in through the ducts first to make sure that they actually go somewhere, and then we will crawl through them in proper movie fashion. They're pretty sure that the vent goes to the room, but of course the robot has run into like the, the great part of the vent where they can't get through. And they're like, okay, let's crawl in. And then some of them are like, no, it's too dangerous. We don't know what's in there. So Bentley's like, I could get out a different camera, you know, my little snake cam that can go down in and, and show us what's in the room. And they're like, nah, that's too much hassle. All of a sudden our main character is once again being a wet blanket. Like he was 
Literally, it said on the page that he was as excited for this as he was for Christmas. But now he's here, and they're like, we're going in the, the thing, and he's like, nope, fuck it, I'm, I'm out, I'm leaving, and you guys should too. And they're like, no, we're going, and you can leave if you want, but you're not the boss of us. And it's just like, what? What? Books do need conflict and character conflict, but it needs to come from the characters. Not because, oh, there needs to be a conflict here. These characters don't have personalities, so every conflict feels like it comes the fuck out of nowhere and feels so pointless. <laughs> oh, they did teleport in. They just needed the vents to get them out. Oh my gosh, this is so fucking confusing. I have no words for these people. They talk and often act like older than they are, but they, make, they still make decisions like dumb 12-year-olds. So, I mean, I guess what did I expect, but really. So they teleported into the room and there's a book on a pedestal, a really old looking book, and I can only assume it's the Necronomicon. Klaatu, Mirada, Necronomicon. So they realize that they are not alone in the room and they turn to see two very old looking chairs. In one is seated a skeleton and in the other is seated Finch, who appears to be asleep. Good job, guys. The villain, this like suave older man, just said, do you guys understand how monumental this moment is? Do you guys? This is not how this guy talks, what the heck? So apparently, our main character's grandfather and old Finch here started the cult kind of by accident, this cult of believers. When they were kids, they wanted to rebel teenagers or whatever, they wanted to rebel, and so they formed a, their own, like, little club that they just pretended was about resurrecting Elbin. And then I guess it turned into a cult, you know, as you do. And this secret library room was their clubhouse. The main character's yelling at the bad guy for putting his mom in a coma, and the bad guy says, I mean, I wasn't ever going to actually hurt you. You turned into giant fire Godzilla and were blasting fireballs at them. What was that supposed to be? Was that just like you felt like it and you wanted to look cool? No, you were trying to hurt them. We've kind of forgotten the other kids are in the room because he's just, the main character's just having a conversation with the bad guy. The bad guy has made our main character take the Necronomicon, which apparently contains the original prophecy of Elebin's return. And then Finch just wishes them into the cornfield He's done having his conversation with the main character, being like, heavily implying that Finch believes himself to be the one who does all, or whatever, and then he's just like, psh, cornfield, and the main character remembers that he has friends who have literally stood there silently doing absolutely nothing the entire time the main character talked to the villain. Oh, he, the, the author throws in a tiny little thing here at the very end of the chapter, that the other characters had been forced to be silent thanks to Fitch's powers. So Fitch just has whatever powers he needs, and if he wants to have a conversation with the main character where nobody else talks, he just uses his powers. Now, it could have been expressed better by letting us realize, like, through the main character that his friends were maybe struggling to talk or looked very frustrated or were, like, frozen if they couldn't move at all. It, like, but none of that was given to us, so it just seemed like another situation in which the author forgot to write the reactions of other characters because he notoriously does that. And that's the end of that chapter, and my gosh, this book just keeps going, but we gotta get there. <sighs> Why are there so many pages? There does not need to be so many pages in this monster. I've said it with so many of these books that I have read here, but this could also be a novella. So many novice books have just endless amounts of pointless scenes, pointless chapters, pointless paragraphs. Just get into your book and eliminate what doesn't need to be there. I know it's a struggle, I struggle with it too. It's something we all have to do, and it's very difficult and not fun. But you gotta do it, or you end up with this. All right, let's get on with it. On with chapter 19. By the way, my latest candy obsession is these M&M's chocolate bars. I don't know why I like them, they're low quality chocolate. And the only place in our area that sells them is Fleet Farm, so I have to go to Fleet Farm find an excuse to go to Fleet Farm. <laughs> like, do the horses need more grain? Because I need chocolate. This book is legitimately turning me off other superhero fiction, because I'm also listening to a book right now that's also superhero fiction, also by an indie author, 
but it's considerably better than this, and eventually I'm going to have a review of it. But like, this book is making me not want to listen to that book. So this chapter starts out with Chad the bully giving our main character a wholehearted apology, which makes me go, what did they do to you, Chad? I, I cannot shake this feeling of ominousness about what happened to Chad. And I just feel like he was taken to some sort of deprogramming station or something. They were like, uh-oh, he's gonna go supervillain. And they took him to, like, supervillain um, deprogramming camp or whatever you want to call it. Like, what do you call those terrible places where they try to make you pray out the gay? I think they made him pray out the supervillain. <laughs> I know I'm more worried about the bully than the blind main character who is beaten up mercilessly by this bully, but legitimately, the main character has no personality, so it's really hard to care about him. Also, this book has a tendency to just go in a direction. I don't know if it's like meant to keep you in suspense. Like, it ends the last chapter with our main character facing off with uh, the villain of the book, I would presume, and it begins this chapter with an apology from the bully and makes you wait. I'm assuming we're gonna find out, but it's making you wait to find out whether our main character told his dad about the encounter with the supervillain and what he's gonna do about that, and instead it's like, no, you want this bully subplot right now. Oh, we've got the bully with an abusive father cliche. Ding! That's a really cliche cliche, too. I'm kind of surprised that a guy who points out cliches for a living didn't, like, notice that in his own writing. So I was right. They legitimately sent him to a camp for kids who are in danger of turning into supervillains to be reprogrammed. My feeling of horror was correct, and I would honestly much rather be following Chad as a character. I, I know, poor Chad, he beat up a blind kid for no apparent reason, but still, they sent the guy to... A, he was beaten by his father, and then they sent him to a deprogramming boot camp. He, he's probably not apologizing out of an actual desire to apologize. He's probably apologizing because he doesn't want to be tortured anymore. Chad lost an arm at the boot camp? Like, oh my gosh. Yes, Chad was very bad to beat up a blind kid for no reason. But also, he has officially been punished disproportionate to his crime. His arm is gone. They didn't even ask him. He just woke up in the hospital and his arm was gone. A truck fell on it, apparently. At this camp, apparently they were fixing a truck and his buddy dropped a fucking truck on his arm and he woke up and his arm was gone. So, yeah, Chad is not having a good time. Oh, I see. So he's disabled. So now he understands being a disabled kid. So that's why he's apologizing. Wow. I hate that so much. Like, I could never understand that it's bad to beat up a blind kid unless I myself was also disabled. Like, wow. Stop it! Why is Chad being added as a character? Maybe he's not. Maybe he's just gonna apologize and then go away. But like, I get the feeling that he's gonna become part of the group, and this author has already proven that he cannot keep track of like four characters in a scene at the same time, so adding Chad is not going to help. The three characters on the cover is a great demonstration. These are the only characters the author cares about at all, and they are the only ones that he ever remembers are in any given scene. We still don't know if the main character has talked to his dad yet about encountering the supervillain again. Although apparently one of their teachers has gone missing, so that's great. Conveniently, the main character was suddenly against going down into the null power zone or whatever in the library, so that now his friends have to come groveling back to him and he can be like the, cor the right one as the main character, he is correct, and his friends have to be like, we're so sorry, you were so right. Let main characters be wrong. That's a really important thing. Main characters should be wrong. It should be in character for them to be wrong. You can't just make them wrong for no reason. But, like, if it's in character, let them be wrong. Let Philip have been the gung-ho one about going in there and then realizing that he had made a grave miscalculation. Let him apologize, because that's what heroes do. Real heroes fuck up, but then they fix it. There's a whole bunch of redundancy happening in this paragraph. Chad comes by while the kids are eating lunch, and the main character is like, hey Chad, and they like just have a very brief hey, hey. And the other kids are like, why are we friends with Chad now? And then we have, 
Well, I said, deciding to explain things a bit further, which is already redundant. You don't need to say deciding to explain things a bit further because that will be evident as the reader continues to read. But also, he explains everything, and we, the reader, were already present for the scene where Chad apologized. So, like, why are we watching it again? Stop it! <laughs> what, are you, some kind? Don't, don't do that! I'm assuming at this point that Chad is going to turn out to be a villain again. It's hmm, it's really tough to know which which cliche we're going to go for. Is Chad going to become one of the group and be like the redeemed bully or is he going to infiltrate the group and surprise, I'm still evil. The main character is thinking of asking him to join the team, so I could see a betrayal happening for sure. But the main character doesn't make mistakes. So, hmm, he, he still does dumb teenager things, but like when he has an idea or a plan, it's always the right thing to do. I don't know, he replied, obviously on the fence. I mean, yeah, obviously he's on the fence. He just said, I don't know. So you don't need to say, obviously on the fence. You could have so many fewer words in this book just by deleting that redundant stuff, Jeremy Scott. Please get a better editor next time. Pay for someone more expensive. I don't even know if you got an editor at all. Besides, like, did you have anyone look at this book before you just, like, sent it in for a copy edit? I have not found very many, if any, typos. So at least there's that. But it takes more than being typo-free to be a good book. And lots of good books have typos. I, I will stand that. I think you can be a good book and have typos, but you need more than no typos to be a good book. It's just what I believe. I'm kind of surprised that the school is going ahead with the next Super Sim when there is an obvious supervillain just like loose in their town. They didn't believe the kids at first about the library thing, but they must now because there was a giant cornfield incident with a guy who turned himself into fire Godzilla. So like, why are they still like, yes, we're gonna let the children run around the streets pretending to be superheroes for a day. We're gonna keep this larping event going on, that's really important. Now they're talking to the main character's dad about the bully situation. We are just fully into this bully situation. And they're talking about, can bad guys ever turn good? And they're talking about the main character's grandfather. And he, there's this line, he was betrayed by his best friend Luther, who used his powers to keep Thomas from defending himself against Artemis. I don't remember who any of those people are. I don't even know if I can recap it for you. The story of the main character's grandfather's death. They're fighting the supervillain. Him and his buddy were fighting the supervillain on top of the Empire State Building. The grandfather's buddy betrayed him, and the grandfather was killed and thrown off the Empire State Building. And then the buddy immediately felt guilty and sh sh literally shoved the, the supervillain off of the Empire State Building. And that's supposed to show that people can change. The, the friend who betrayed the grandfather, he went to prison, he did his time for betraying the grandfather, and now he's living a peaceful life. And the kids are like, how do you know he's living a peaceful life? And the dad's like, well, it's because he lives in this town and he's the farmer who ignored you the other night when you were calling for help because he vowed to never use his powers again. And apparently children being killed by fire Godzilla in his cornfield is none of his business. Let's take a drink every time the dad says absorption and power in this paragraph. Well, Philip, his power, drink, is called absorption, drink. People with the power, drink, of absorption, drink, are incredibly powerful. That counts. Take another drink. The power is basically like a sponge soaking up the powers of any superhuman in the vicinity. It's one of the rarest powers around. Holy shit. You should try not to use the same word too much in the same paragraph, and um, that's officially too much. So the main character is like, how did Grandpa manage to get killed then? Because with his absorption powers, he should have been able to like cast a null field over the supervillain. The father doesn't say anything about that, but he finishes the story with like, that's why it's important to forgive people, because people can turn out to be good instead of evil. And then the main character's like, that doesn't make any sense at all, even though the main character was the one who wanted to add the bully to his team. So like, decide whether you think bad guys can turn good or not, kiddo. That's the end of that chapter. That was a chapter, alright. 
I can't imagine what the climax of this book is gonna look like. I suppose more Godzilla stomping around, who knows. Hi, all right, so I'm wearing makeup because I was gonna try to film other videos today and I even did up my nails fresh and everything, but then it was something that I needed the internet for and our internet is being an absolute butt today. So I'm like, you know what, I'm not wasting this look. I'm not wasting these lips. I'm just gonna read this. So at least I'm doing something. And hopefully I can get those other videos to work because I've been literally trying to get the internet to work with me for like two hours and I'm ready to scream. You know, the most annoying thing is that I, all of my like comfortable, like lounging in pants are super thin fabric. And this cat is the pokiest cat in the world. So like, she can't sit on my lap while I'm doing this because she will stab me in the leg 80 million times before she settles down. And I'm just not into that. This just shows you how this kid views his mom and honestly, how this book views the mom. It's Christmas time and the kid is sad because his mom is in a coma. I tried for weeks to ignore the coming holiday, instead telling myself that mom would wake up in time to take on her usual array of holiday cheer responsibilities. Holiday cheer responsibilities. I mean, he is 12 and 12 year olds can be selfish little shits, but like he doesn't want his mom to wake up so that she will no longer be in a coma. He wants her to wake up so that Christmas can be normal. She has responsibilities, damn it. Apparently, and again, we're just being told this, we don't see this. He, for like a few weeks before Christmas, he was in Christmas denial. He's like, it's not coming because mom isn't here. And then he just randomly decided, like, again, we're just being told, he decided that he was gonna go the other way and everything was gonna be super Christmassy. And it definitely feels more to me like the author was like, mm, I'm gonna have him not look forward to Christmas. And then was like, no, that's boring. I'm gonna have him be really into Christmas. But like, Rather than deleting the first part about how he's not looking forward to Christmas, he just left both parts in. It's like this, it's like I'm reading his notes. Are you religious, Jeremy Scott? You don't strike me as the type, but maybe he is. The main character's all like, perhaps God would let her come back to us. The person who's keeping her from coming back to you is the supervillain, so like, if you want to take it up with somebody, you should probably take it up with the supervillain. He keeps making Henry come over so that he can see things. That's gotta be super annoying for, for Henry. Like, Henry, come over so that I can cook easily. You're my seeing eye person, Henry. Come here. He decides that he wants to bake some of his mother's favorite Christmas recipes, so he calls his friend over to do that. We don't see that scene. We're just told that that's what happened. And then Dad comes in on them baking and making a mess, and we don't get to see that scene. We're just told that Dad's, like, a little upset but forgives him. The little brother has been having nightmares, but we don't get to see that either. We're just told that it's happening. Like, any of these pick one and make it an actual scene that we watch. It is okay to tell sometimes. Usually when you want to move the story along and get to the next important scene, you can be a bit telly in the meantime. But like, we are skipping so many things that you were telling us about that it's like, why don't you pick one and at least let us watch it. He brings a radio to play Christmas music for his mom. We don't watch that scene either. He goes on about how they had their little Christmas in the hospital and then they went home and had like regular Christmas at home and he talks about how the Christmas in the hospital had felt like a mirage, like it was fake, and that this would all be interesting information if we had seen any of it. It's like this author just wrote things. Just wrote, like whatever idea came into his head. He's just type typing away like, oh, the kid probably felt sad about his mom being in the hospital and oh, you know what, they, they probably went to the hospital and had Christmas with her there, but, but then they probably had a regular Christmas at home too and but that, that Christmas probably felt really shallow and sad. Where are the actual scenes to go with this stuff? Instead it's just, it's like he's coming up with these thoughts, writing a paragraph about them and moving on. So the main character's two best friends, Henry, who helps him see, and Bentley, the genius, are gone for the holidays. They went on holiday for the holidays, so he is forced to hang around with Donnie, the spare. Donnie is the real MVP of this book in many ways, but today it's because the main character likes to go on walks around town with Donnie, and the main character just talks, like, the whole time, and we have heard him talk, and we know what a little wiener he is, so Donnie is the MVP for just walking around and quietly listening to this 
12 year old brat whine. I know this kid's mom is in a coma, and if this kid was even anything resembling a character that felt like a real person, maybe I'd feel bad. So he's walking along with Donnie, and he's talking, and walking and talking with old Donnie, and he's talking about how it doesn't make sense that the bad guy left his mother alive and in a coma, why doesn't he just kill her? And I'm like, yeah, that's one of the logical flaws in the bad guy's plan. One of them. But then our main character says, Spending time with Bentley had taught me to examine the logic behind things. Um, I call bullshit on that. Uh, Bentley is only the smart one when the book claims that he is. And finally, we spend the last page and a half of this chapter establishing something we already knew. He manages to get Donnie to respond to him, which is good. At least he's actually trying to interact with Donnie a little bit here. But they're talking about Donnie's superpower, and he's like, I think you're fast, Donnie. Is, isn't that your superpower? Isn't it speed or whatever? And Donnie finally says yes. But it's like we, as readers, knew that. You told us a chapter ago the, that what Donnie had done. Donnie went and got the dad and ran back really fast. So why is the main character now treating it as though he's not sure that Donnie's power is speed and he wants to verify it with him? Get rid of that earlier thing and just leave this. Just leave this nice character interaction here. It makes your character look smarter. It makes this, everything flow better. This is why we show instead of tell people. Stop. It's this month's patrons. Ray, Artemis, Shelby, Zaire, Jesper, Raikio, Irene, Scribbling Cat, Savvy, Jenny, Amanda, Lisa, Callison, Lennox, and Anne Sophie. All right, carry on with your day. Okay then. That's it. Cool. I said the word. I did. <laughs>